The uh, tantalizing promise of quantum computers is that they can do certain tasks exponentially faster than classical machines. And the quantum supremacy experiment is proof that this is indeed the case. Technologies are born this way. Let's say the space age started with a satellite orbiting Earth, and it was not doing much, it was just beeping. The big technical achievement of quantum supremacy was really dependent on all this young talent who's kind of taken this and gotten it to work at a very technologically capable level. We have reached a new computational capability. There are certain computations, the only place in the world where you can compute those things is here in our data center at Google Santa Barbara. For the first time, we're showing that we can solve a problem that is just infeasible to do on the biggest computers ever made by civilization. And what's exciting is now we're ready to turn this over to the world and say, let's figure out what we can do with this. The thing that excites me most is building a useful quantum computer. When we can give a researcher a tool that is unlike any other and say, great, figure out something cool to do with it, mankind is pretty good at that. So Google's been doing some work in secret. NASA, which was a partner in this work, inadvertently published a paper which they almost immediately unpublished, but before too long, people were able to get a copy of it. Of course. The, the Google research paper was titled Quantum Supremacy Using a Programmable Superconducting Processor. In this paper, uh, it was asserted that the Google uh, quantum computer was able to, to solve a problem 50,000 times faster than the world's fastest traditional supercomputer. That's so, amazing. It's, a con mm. it's, it's not a task you would want. Right. It's not solving a problem that anyone cares about, but it is a, <laughs> it's merely a demonstration that you right. could do it. Uh, the, it's the proof of concept. Yeah. It's it's kind of a random number thing, but uh, it was able to do it according to the paper in three minutes and twenty seconds. What would take the world's fastest supercomputer summit ten thousand years? So this is this is important. It might in fact be the kind of thing that you'll look back and say, "Oh, I remember back in 2019 when we first." He he likens it. Aronson likens it to Kitty Hawk. So the first mm. flight of the Wright brothers, which, by the way, didn't become public for months, right. <laughs> certainly didn't imply that we'd be able to fly across the country or across around the world it in was a just jet hobbyist, airplane. Just hobbyist yeah. doing but it was do. the first time humans flew mm -hmm. for any length, any appreciable distance. And that's kind of what this is. So... So quantum supremacy has been achieved, or proven, or whatever, or not, depending on who you ask. Google, obviously, just announced earlier this week uh, that they have succeeded in their project, stemming from this paper that people have been talking about for a while now with NASA. But earlier this week, they just, it's basically just a commercial that they put out. And, and so it's the kind of thing where it's, yeah, this could be a big deal, it's a big deal, but it's also all predicated on what I don't know how to see as anything other than a, just a complete and utter logical fallacy and pseudoscience. And the fact that NASA's involved is sort of just perfect, perfectly fitting, because it's, it's the same sort of thing where, yeah, they're building stuff. <laughs> NASA's building rockets and building space planes and you know building stuff on the ground and they're they're doing something, but where exactly it's going? Like NASA can't explain what the real purpose of trying to go put people on the moon or Mars is if you can't even leave the solar system without somehow achieving interdimensional travel at some point. 
So there's no clear objective, just like with quantum computing, they, they constantly talk about how there's no, we don't really know what we're going to do with it, but we're going to build it and then figure out what we're going to do with it, because that's what people spend billions of dollars on. You know. So obviously it's going to be doing something. It's going to be used in some way, but I, it's just surreal. Because, of course, nobody's... The whole debate is over whether they actually achieved quantum supremacy, but whether they actually showed that a quantum computer could do a computation that would take a classical computer 10,000 years, or if they were just manipulating the, the algorithms or interpreting the, the data in certain ways. There's guys from IBM who were contesting it, you know, contesting this claim of quantum supremacy, but it's... The whole point is that nobody's debating something as basic as this whole concept of the qubit you know and, that, and for me that's the thing i can't even get past just this whole qubit idea <laughs> that it's a one and a zero at the same time and so you can use that to do calculations that a classical digital bit computer cannot do and it's just a, it's bizarre because this idea when you really stop and think about it this idea that of being in two states at the same time that, that sort of arose going all the way back to guys like Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and, and all this stuff. Where they're trying to break down the essence of all these subatomic particles and quantify their spin, even though spin isn't doesn't really mean spin in the, the sense that we use it in everyday language. It means something completely different. It's just a word attached to a numerical value that can alternate and the whole wave-particle duality, where things are... It's a wave and it's a particle. So essentially, when they're trying to, you know, understand light a hundred years ago, and they essentially come to this paradox where, yeah, in some ways, it acts like a wave and some, like, a particle, and we have these bell curve probability <laughs> equations to describe this paradox, basically. And so what starts out as this paradox, this contradiction, where there, there's these two incompatible ideas and, and concepts that they're trying to reconcile. So it starts out as, a, as something that they're, they are unable to un understand, somehow becomes the core thing that you now do understand, that you can now turn around and, and uh, something that was an impossibility is now just fact. This qubit idea. It's a one and a zero at the same time. Even though the whole the whole basis for them postulating that this idea was because when they supposedly observed the uh, subatomic particle in question, then it would, you would force it to to pick a state, right? The whole double slit experiment kind of thing. So the paradox becomes the new reality, and then that's this new reality is how we're we're supposedly building this this supercomputer machine. It's beyond bizarre. And yet, it's just now being accepted as fact. The qubit. The unquestioned self-contradiction. And people say believing in, in God is crazy and contradictory. But quantum states and qubits that are ones and zeros at the same time, doing all the same sorts of calculations at the same time, that's not crazy. But you can't make this stuff up. I mean, in this commercial, he's, he's comparing it to the space race and Sputnik. And all it did was beep. Right? And that was all the proof, quote-unquote, that it, people really had for that Sputnik. They, they saw a light in the sky that was supposedly a 14-inch shiny ball, however many miles up in the, in the uh, atmosphere. Supposedly able to see it with, like, a telescope or binoculars. And it beeped when it went overhead. So there you go. It must be a, a satellite. We can detect the beeps. That's all they're doing with this quantum stuff, is just detecting beeps. Assuming that it's coming from the, the places that they say it's coming from.